I'm very pleased this afternoon to welcome back Tenen as our moderator for this afternoon's session. Tenen, you can do our uh, welcome and um, introduce our speakers. Thank you, um, Patricia. I don't think I need to introduce myself again, or do I? <laughs> Well, just for those coming in newly, I am Tenen Gite. I am from the Gambia, an international student. I am um, a graduate student with DePaul um, in the school, Gray School of Applied Diplomacy, currently pursuing a degree in applied diplomacy. And um, I'm happy to be here. So I'll be a moderator for this, um, for the fourth plenary session on hope and action for a sustainable future. Barbara Wheeler is an associate professor in DePaul's Department of Communication Studies and holds an affiliate faculty appointment with the Department of Environmental Science and Studies. A past recipient of DePaul's Excellent in Teaching Award, she teaches courses in Environmental Studies, Rhetorical Studies, and Sustainability. In her research, she examines how the rhetoric of popular culture and environmental rhetoric intersect informing and influencing cultural practices. Welcome, um, Dr. Barbara Wieland. Well, I, I have a presentation that I'm going to share, a PowerPoint, but um, before I start, I just wanted to, my, well, here, I'll go ahead and share it before I get going or else I'll never get to it. So um, if you don't mind, I will move on to that. Okay. You might be hearing that chipmunk now. All right, so I don't uh, how many of you are TED Talk fans, but um, I like to watch a TED Talk from time to time. And um, one of my favorites is Nick Marks, who is the founder of the United Kingdom Center for Wellbeing and the founder of the think tank New Economic Foundation, all about sustainability and well-being. And his TED Talk, he starts out, by saying, uh, Martin Luther King never started his presentation, his great march presentation with I have a nightmare. He started his great presentation by saying, I have a dream. And, you know, there's something to that. And yet, climate change activists and environmental activists typically start their presentations with the nightmares and, and the, um, the fearfulness that they have. And this is not a motivating technique, and you think we would have uh, learned this by now. So I would like to talk a little bit about environmental communication and climate change communication and what the research tells us about how it is that we should be communicating about these incredibly important issues and what we should be doing in order to motivate people to enact change. So um, I'd like to talk about hope for our future. And indeed, another future is possible, but it is not promised. These are not empty words. These are not just optimism and hope for its own sake, but rather it's very, um, it's optimism that is rooted in reality. Okay, so let's, uh, without further ado, I'll carry on. All right, so too often environmental communication is so bleak and hopeless and frightening. So how many times have we seen climate change communication represented by the bleakness of the stranded polar bears or you know, the sort of nightmarish visions of energy production? And while all these are true, um, these apocalyptic visions do nothing more than give us no solutions, no action to take, um, and they're really ineffective at producing change what they are effective, and the research indicates they are effective at garner, garnering our attention. We are indeed moved to kind of, you know, as, as if we're drawn to some sort of a horror show, Halloween's around the corner, it's sort of that same attention. But like a Halloween movie, we're just sort of frozen in fear. And we take this sort of fatalistic position. Some of you might have even read the 2017 New Yorker, or not, not New Yorker, New York Magazine article written by David Wallace Wells, The Uninhabitable Earth, where he took all the most dire predictions of very good quality scientific uh, evidence um, of climate change, the future of climate change, and he produced it in this particular article, The Uninhabitable Earth. It became such a widely cited magazine article that it was produced into a book in 2019. I bought the book, I read the book, and 
if you have not read the book, I would say, if you want to read it, go ahead, but prepare yourself for the bleakest. So does that work? No. Research indicates it does not. What does work? Well, messages with solutions, orientation, and hope. But messages that do indeed ask us to do something, get our, our uh, boots on the ground, get our hands dirty, to just smooth over <laughs> the damage that has been done. And so I'd like to uh, uh, reinforce this with someone you heard from just last night, Christy Klimas. This is an article from an aptly named uh, online magazine called Better. Um, and she just published this article in 2020, in February of 2020, right just before we closed for COVID. You said it, um, let's, oh, I can't see, let's counter bad news with success to inspire action on climate change. And I just thought I'd quote this little bit right here. Having worked in the Amazon on alternatives to deforestation, a contributing factor to climate change for over a decade, I find inspiration and energy in the work of the many communities, nonprofits, and individuals who have dedicated their lives to local change. Too often this work flies under the radar and that needs to change and indeed it does need to change. We need to tell the stories of what works. We need to tell the stories of the actions people are taking and how they are making a change. And of course, Pat had this great idea of the stories of hope and stories of change that people are doing. So. If you all haven't had a chance to, um, or didn't, weren't able to see the um, presentations yesterday of the stories of hope and change, or haven't taken a look at the website, um, we should, because that's the type of thing that motivates change. So well, let's talk a little bit about what is hope. There's actually a theory of hope. How about that? And I think Pat mentioned that as a kickoff to this whole conference. Charles Snyder's theory of hope. So I'll just review it and go into a little bit more detail, but then I want to go into um, quickly findings on research and the theory of hope. So first of all, there are goals, like what we want to happen that would, you know, some sort of action. So in our case, we want the earth to be sustainable, uh, certainly more sustainable than it is now. We want um, to reverse the sort of climate change catastrophe that people predict, like David, David Wallace Wells and certainly the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, and so in order to do that, then we need pathway thinking. We need we have to find roots to get there. That's what hope will give us. What is the route to get to those goals? And finally, we have to have agency. What is the motivation? How can we use those pathways? We can't just say we want to get there. How are we gonna follow those pathways? So in one particular study on hope and climate change, um, of youth, and I have this picture right here. This is me leading, um, the, some of you might remember about a year ago, or. Um, yeah, I guess it was a little over a year ago when we had the September 9, 2019 uh, March in Chicago, climate change march. Here I am with my students. I'm holding the sign, the climate is changing. Why aren't we? And there's a group of students who um, belong to campus, the um, Climate Reality Campus Corps at DePaul. And there we are marching through um, the Red Line Tunnel to get to our, to our march so um, there we are with hope <laughs> for climate change uh, reversing direction so in any case in this particular study they studied 422 young adults in Sweden and they came up with this idea of you really need constructive hope so it can't just be blind hope it has to be constructive hope so what is that well first of all you need a positive reappraisal of the situation so you need to put things in historical perspective. So for example, what you might say about climate change is, wow, awareness has really increased. 10 years ago, people didn't even know what climate change was, or many people still didn't believe in it. Yes, there are people who don't believe in it now, but boy, I think there are Republicans who even talk about it, believe in it. So thinking in a positive and op optimistic ways. You need to trust in resources outside of yourself. So you can't just say, well, I can do little things myself. But yes, I mean, we can't blindly just believe in technology to save us. We have to have some faith in technology and environmental organizations and our politicians to be able to make the right uh, decisions about what to do. And then trust in our own ability to influence problems in a positive direction. I can make a difference. 
So this constitutes constructive help, uh, hope, excuse me. It isn't just some blind faith. So in their findings of these 422 Swedish young people that they, they examined, um, they found that hope plus denial, in other words, people who were hopeful about the future of uh, the environment because they didn't think there was anything wrong, <laughs> did not engage in any type of environmental action. <laughs> Imagine that. Why would you if you didn't think there was a problem? Constructive hope, on the other uh, hand, the ones that, with the characteristics that I just described, they would engage. They would take action. They would vote. They would advocate. They would talk to other people about it. Constructive hope plus parental influence, parents who believed in it, that gave us the strongest, strongest predictor of engagement and taking action. So uh, the results of the study basically said environmental education plus um, need a value-based education, and that would give us hope. So environmental education must include values-based education, which of course this whole conference is about. So way to go, Pat. We're organizing all of this. Um, and of course, especially positive reappraisal is important. So giving positive news, um, recognizing the good that has happened thus far, focusing on the solutions, focusing on what ha has happened so far. So I want to um, quickly talk a little bit about um, some of the good that has happened so far and some people that are engaging on the, you know, on the front lines. Some of you might be familiar with the book, The Future We Choose, and that was by um, Christiana Figueres, who was the executive sec secretary of um, the UN talks, uh, climate change talks, uh, the 2015 talks that led to the Paris Climate Agreement. So she was incredibly successful. She didn't start out that way. In fact, um, when asked initially if she ever thought there would, that the UN climate talks would ever come to an agreement, the first thing she said was never in her lifetime. And then she realized that she would have to change that kind of stinking thinking, and <laughs> she did. And she developed what she felt was, here she is with her partner, um, her helper, stubborn optimism. Um, and, and in fact, they have a website, I won't go to it because it's too hard to switch to a link on Zoom, but Global Optimism, if you want to check out their website, they always give really positive stories of global optimism, by the way. But their feeling is you have to be stubborn in your optimism and you have to take action and you have to take practical action. So apt optimism to them is the input necessary to meet our challenges, but they have to be very practical. Um, and her feeling is that given her experience with directing the climate talks that led to the Paris Agreement, you have to have lots of adaptive ingenuity. In other words, you cannot be stubborn, you have to be able to be flexible, you have to be able to develop compromises, bring people together, find common ground. This is what she has found. Um, that, and, and then consistently be optimistic about making those adaptions. Um, and so with the Paris Accord, of course, really quickly, many of you are aware, you know, probably know this like the back of your hand, they finally came up to with this particular agreement with the warming, keeping warming to one and a half degrees centigrade, um, Celsius, excuse me, 50% um, reduction of carbon dioxide by 2030. Uh, hope we get there, optimism, and net zero by 2050. So um, just in the interest of time, just because I want to leave enough time, I won't go into prior to even um, the Paris Climate Accord, they had come up with Mission 2020. I shouldn't say prior, after the Paris Climate Accord, they came up with Mission 2020. And they had some goals they wanted to meet that haven't been met. But, um, you know, there are still some things we can do, like, you know, approving no more coal-fired power plants. Um, coming up with decarbonized buildings and infrastructure by 2050. And I wanted to show this. This is a Chicago architectural film, this picture right here, um, of their decarboned loop uh, vision. There is one that exists. Um, you know, just completely changing the U.S. car stock and worldwide car stock at that to electric vehicles, doubling of mass transit, 
um, increase our car stocks fuel efficiency by 20% um, and decrease greenhouse gases in uh, aviation by 20%, although I think COVID took care of that for us, at least momentarily. Um, and there are other things that we can be doing. Aforestation and reforestation. Aforestation is where you put in a forest where none existed before, and then reforestation, of course, is um, you know, bringing a forest back to its, its healthy original uh, state. Um, and that can actually act as a forest uh, carbon sink. Um, having indus industry, especially industry that functions to produce a lot of CO2, like iron, steel, cement, uh, the chemical industries, oil and gas, goes without saying. And then um, hope and green bonds, green bonds, especially for those countries in the global south um, and in the Arctic uh, areas where they have a very difficult time paying for the mitigating of uh, the efforts um, because of climate change. Green bonds is where you buy into, it's an you know, investment, um, and then those bonds go to pay for mitigation efforts. And it is a international um, effort. And it has been recently uh, doubling, tripling in, um, its, uh, in its growth because so many people are starting to invest in it more and more. So that's very exciting. So there's lots of good news. Um, I was going to read just, just part of the good news. Sometimes when we're in the United States, we get, especially now because of the current administration, we get a lot of bad news. But there really is quite a bit of good news worldwide. Um, and we can have an, an optimistic mindset because of this good news. So you can think of things like what has already happened. The UK already has 50% clean energy. Uh, Costa Rica already has 100% clean energy. Iceland, 85% clean energy. It can be done. New York already has a law on the books that they'll be tw by 2040, they'll be 100% um, uh, clean energy. California and Hawaii, they'll be 100% clean energy by 2045. Norway, the Netherlands, France, and the UK have all laid out similar plans to eventually ban the sale of cars with internal combustion engines. So it's clear that there's a lot being done already, and these are the kinds of positive stories that we need to share. And I think I'll stop it there. I had a little bit more to say, but I'm running over time. So I shall stop and turn it over to, is that what I do now? Do I just turn it over to our next speaker? No, you're or, good. <laughs> yeah? Yes. Um, thank, okay. you very, thank you for that. Okay, really very good. Thank you. It was quite informative and educative at the same time. Okay. Um, oh, so, all right. Well, good. I wanted to just make sure. I was... No, you, you were amazing. <laughs> thank you as well. So um, I'd like to open the floor now for anyone who has any questions to add. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's, it's definitely... There is hope in the presentations you've done. There is a huge message that, well, it, if we work together, we can definitely see the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, I think we can if we even start seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. We just have to keep working together and for the better of the, the entire world. I mean, we have only one planet. If we mess it up, where do we go? <laughs> um, if you have any questions, um, please bring it forward. And um, I think the question that I have right now uh, would be for Barbara Wheeler. Um, you, you talk about hope, especially in, in, in the urban, urban setting. Um, usually when we look at urban settings in, in most part of the world, in most countries, it's urban areas are causing more pollution than most. And we figured, we sometimes we feel like in order to save the planet, we have to deter ourselves from modern, from modern stuff from, from the urban region, urban areas in the countries. Um, how do you counter that message that we can, you can live in an urban environment yet live a sustainable lifestyle that is healthy for the planet? Uh, Barbara? Well, one thing that I, I talk a lot about in my classes is that, you know, in urban environments do end up 
producing more greenhouse gases, obviously, and more waste because there's more people gathered there. But ultimately, it is, believe it or not, a more eco-minded place to live. It's a more, a more environmentally sound place to live for a host of reasons, because your, your ecological footprint is smaller when you live in an urban environment. You take up less space, you use less square footage, you share more infrastructure, so you share more you know, sewage, you share more plumbing, you share more heat, you share more walls. Um, you know, imagine you know, if you live vertically as opposed to living horizontally, you're just not using up as much of the, of the environment. And so ideally, if you were to take one of those like ecological footprint calculators, I'm sure everyone has tried those or a carbon. And if you, if you switch your, if you take one living in a city and then you kind of switch your address to, if you lived in a, in a cut in the country, your, your uh, footprint almost always automatically goes up. If you live in the country or you live in the suburbs, because you just take, end up using up more space. So, but you, you have the appearance of using up more of the environment or creating more um, carbon dioxide and all sorts of emissions just because there are more people in that particular space. But imagine if we took all the people that lived in the city and then just spread them out. We would have no more room for all of these open spaces so that you know, we'd have these untouched areas, we'd have these wilderness areas, we'd have these forests that could be carbon sinks. We ended up using them all so that people could just spread out. So anyway, I'll, I'll be quiet and let other people respond. Well, and something to take into account too for cities, because people are more localized, that cuts down on a lot of transportation issues. So um, almost like the, like the example I gave earlier with the Amazon truck coming to campus three to five mm -hmm. times a day, if there's a way to have everything delivered in bulk, you know, for one, one trip instead of multiple trips to multiple areas, you're saving a lot just from greenhouse gases um, just because you're not burning fossil fuels to get there. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your beautiful responses. And any questions before I hand it over to, back to Patricia and Amanda? Oh, also, I just wanted another comment um, when you were talking about sort of how to make urban areas more sustainable. Mm -hmm. um, Cincinnati actually has a green Cincinnati plan that was adopted in 2018. And it's got, I think it's eight different um, sort of areas that it touches on and 10 different goals for each of those areas. Um, and we hope to be net zero by, I think it's 2035. Um, and as far as I know, we may be the first city in the U.S. to do that. Um, so, but that's got a whole lot of sort of checkpoints of, okay, these are the goals we're going to go to. So if you're trying to find some way to be more sustainable, I would suggest that as a good place to start. Um, I'd like to hand over back to Patricia and, and Amanda and to my presenters. Thank you very much for your time. This was really inspiring and I'm, I'm really happy to be here. <laughs>